Hebrews chapter 4. Still looking at the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. We've been teaching on that. I hope you've been able to come to the lessons. When I say we, I mean collectively. <laughs> Whether we intended to or not. Tim's services, Nathan's services, the ones I've been doing. Because he's trying to actually get us to live the title of Dave's book. This is the walk of the what? For benefit of the uh, video, there is actually people here. It's called the walk of the what? Walk of the spirit. See, not the walk of the soul, not the walk of the mind, not the walk of man. It is the walk of the spirit, the walk of power. And he said, this is the year of power. So we have to f discern how we're walking. Amen. Glory to God. That's right. <laughs> Got a preacher in the making here. Hallelujah. So it's a walk of the spirit, the walk of power. And that's, boy, if there was a, I wish someone would write a book with that title, you know. Oh, Pastor Dave already has. Now we're getting to live out what he brought by revelation over those years. Now this year, we don't get to just know it. Just knowing it has been okay. No, this year we get to live it. See, that's why he keeps coming back to this, because the power doesn't flow from your mind. The power flows from our spirit as we're anointed by the Holy Ghost. The part of you that is made in the image of God is your spirit person. So that's why he's had us in Ephesians 4 and other places looking at this walk of the Spirit. Now tonight, our foundation verse, or the one kind of my jumping off verse for the series, <clears throat> is Hebrews 4, 12. And so let's just read that verse first. And I think tonight he wants to actually teach using the um, example that the writer of Hebrews used. And even as we teach this tonight, now, see, I, I don't know what you're facing personally right now. It, you, you know, maybe you're battling a, a disease of some kind. I know certain people are, there, you know. Maybe you're battling finances. Maybe you're battling depression. Maybe you're battling, maybe there's family problems. Maybe there's, say, Gary, I have all of those and more that you haven't mentioned. <laughs> well, this message tonight applies to all of those situations. There's no situation where this message tonight does not apply. And if you're going to have victory, you're going to have it from your spirit man. See, So it's important to be able to discern how you're walking. Are you walking by the intellect or are you walking by the spirit? It's really hard to tell sometimes, you know. So we're given some help here. Uh, Hebrews 4, 12 says, For the word of God is quick, and that's just an old English word that means alive. The word... Let me ask you this, John 3.16. It's been written now for, what, a couple of thousand years, I guess. Still yet, though, somebody in a service today, even though that's been, been in, in this book, written down for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. You can go to what, I guarantee you, to, what is this, Wednesday night? I guarantee you, in Bethel Acres, which is just south of Shawnee, Oklahoma, in Pottawatomie County, Tonight, they're preaching Christ and Him crucified at Blackburn Baptist Chapel. <laughs> That's their calling, and they preach it. And when they come to John 3.16, and they preach it correctly, if there's a sinner there, that word will become alive to them, because it is alive. You've got to understand the word of God is not a dead thing. It is alive. It's Full of, just as full of life today as it was when God first said it. Amen? So the Word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Isn't that amazing? It's able to, the Word of God is able to tell you how you're functioning. Dave helped me a lot in the early days when I first heard him. Well, he helps me a lot in the latter days, too. <laughs> but I remember the first time I heard him say this. He says, well, one of, the, one of the easy ways to tell if you're functioning out of your spirit or out of your 
intellect, the soul, is when you've got the symptoms of sickness on you real bad, you know. You've got a 100 degree fever and hacking and wheezing and sweating and achy all over. Of course, none of us faith people are ever like that. Good Lord, that was a joke. You're... <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Anybody home? <laughs> Lights are on? <laughs> I've been there. I know you have too. But now what comes out of your mouth locates where you are, see? I'm sick. <laughs> well, that's the soul man, you know. That's the guy. That's the part of you that is moved by what he feels, moved by what he sees, moved by the circumstances. But the real you, that spirit man, first off, he isn't sick. Second off, he would never say that regardless of the circumstances because what he believes is he believes God can't lie and if God's word says by his stripes I was healed then that's what he's going to say himself blesses my bread and blesses my water and takes sickness away from the midst of me see Himself bore my sicknesses and carried my pains. That type, when you're talking like that, you're operating out of the spirit, not the soul. But that takes uh, transformation. The natural, even the natural Christian, the nor let's say not, the normal Christianity does not function out of their spirit very much. They do so. Thank God for what they do. But where he's called us is to a supernatural revival. Where it's more than just uh, get saved, give your tithes, and go to heaven. <laughs> He's called us to demonstrate the miraculous. And to go far enough into him to bring a supernatural revival to a religious city. Even to the point of emptying children's hospitals. Amen. Well, we're going to have to walk by the Spirit. You do understand, to walk there, to walk in that level of power, we have to walk by the Spirit. Not by the intellect. So let's finish our verse here. He says, The word of God, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And the examples he gives are so perfect. Of the joints and the marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's so interesting to me, he goes to the joints. You know, like a, I have an elbow joint. El elbow? <laughs> I have an elbow joint. I have knee joints. There's joints at my wrist, joints at my knuckles. I got joints all over the place, but you can't see a single one of them. The joints are on the inside of the body, not visible to the naked eye. But the Word of God, in the same way that my joints, you can't see them. But a surgeon could get to them, couldn't he? And even more hidden than the joints is the marrow in the bone. Okay. the marrow is where the blood comes from gives life to the blood you talk about important well what he's saying in the same way that a surgeon's scalpel could divide those hidden things that are not obvious he said the word of God is able to discern for you whether you're walking by the soul or by the spirit man and with practice you can change if you're functioning out of your soul most of the time with practice and the help and the training of the Holy Ghost, you can function by your spirit. How many of you think Jesus functioned that way all the time? You reckon he had a good brain? I reckon he had a magnificent mind. But he didn't walk by his mind. He really didn't. He walked by his spirit. Well, that's how we're going to walk also. So... We've been going through the, my visual parable of the spirit, soul, and body, and I'm not going to even review that tonight, I don't think, but if you were here, keep, those, uh, keep that teaching in mind as we go through this <clears throat> tonight. But tonight we're going, to, we're going to go with the example that the writer of Hebrews gives, okay? Because he gives a very specific example. So let's back up just a little bit. Let's back up to the, to the beginning of chapter 4. <clears throat> He says, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left 
uh, being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Well, well, we don't want that, do we? I don't want to come short of what he's promised us. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them. In other words, they had God's word, but it didn't help them. They'd never had the benefit of it, this group that he's talking about. Why not? Well, because they had his word, but it was not mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Who is he talking about here? All right. Let's back up a little more. You know how Dave says, ask the Holy Ghost to help you here. Ask him, where, where do we back up? Where is the beginning of this? Well, really we'd have to go to Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 <laughs> on this one. But this is okay. Let's, let's back up to chapter 3, um, verse 8, verse 5. Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house. Whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end? Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, today, you know, every generation that has read this down through the centuries, every time they read this, it's still today. That's right. <laughs> today, if you'll hear his voice. We've heard his voice today. We know what he's told us. And we're not going to provoke him like they did. We are going to mix faith with what he said. And we're going to have what he said. Okay. Today if you will hear his voice. Now notice. Harden not your hearts. As in the. Notice that word provocation. We're going to see that in the Old Testament here in a minute. Harden not your hearts. As in the provocation. In the day of temptation. In the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me proved me and saw my works 40 years wherefore I was grieved with that generation and I said they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways so I swear in my wrath that they shall not enter into my rest boy take heed brethren lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief I want you to remember that phrase. Didn't that sound awful? <laughs> An evil heart of unbelief. Boy, I don't want that banner flying over me. I don't want that to be how, the, how I'm described. Doesn't that sound evil? But when we look at it back here, it's, it's going to be what? <laughs> because 99% of the church is still doing today. And they, they call it rational and reasonable. And God calls it an evil heart of unbelief. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end while it is said today if you will hear his voice harden not your hearts as in the provocation for some when they had heard did provoke howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses but with whom was he grieved 40 years was it not with them that had sinned whose carcasses fell in the wilderness and to whom swear that Excuse me. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest. But to them that believe not. 
So we see that they could not enter in because of what? Unbelief. Now we've been teaching lately, been teaching quite a while about this separation, division between soul and spirit. Our spirit has got to be, excuse me, our, our soul is transformed by the renewing of the mind. Is that not what Romans 12, 2 tells us? Be no longer conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of the mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen? Well, the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God for us that are, have attached ourselves to the prayer center is that we bring a supernatural revival to this city first and then spread that revival around the world because there's seven to eight billion people to be harvested on this planet. Right now, the smallest slice of that is saved. God wants them all saved, if possible. And he wants more than just words going forth. He wants demonstrations of power in the Holy Ghost. Okay? All right? We're going to enter in. And if we don't enter in, it'll be because of the same reason they didn't. Unbelief. That's why he's writing this. So let me, now let's continue here for just a little bit. And we're going to look at it. The same example. You notice who he's talking about? The ones that did not get to enter in to the promised land. He, they, had to, they had a word from God like we have a word from God. God had told them what to do like he's told us what to do. They had their chance like we have our chance. They failed. Is that clear enough? We're not going to. Is that clear enough? We're not going to. We're not going to have this evil heart of unbelief. What scared me is when it dawned on it. See, that phrase, it sounds so wicked, doesn't it? Evil heart of unbelief. Man, those were bad dudes. <laughs> but you, you get back there and you see what really it was. And I'm going, how many times have I done that? That same exact thing. No more. I've got to read a little more. I'm going to read from here down to at least our, our, our verse, okay? It's good for you, the Word of God. Good for me. Let us therefore, based on everything he just said, therefore, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein. And they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, notice how many times in this segment he mentions today. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus, and really that should be the word Joshua right there. It's talking about Joshua. If Joshua had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Well, how do you enter into that rest? For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Now, in the context here, these Hebrew children grew up under the law. Everything was based on performance. How do I please God, Daddy? You keep the law. What if I break it? You offer these sacrifices. Everything was based on what you do. But then somebody came and preached Christ and him crucified to them. Showed them that Christ was that lamb that had been uh, prophesied. Every, every lamb that was offered under the old covenant pointed to the day when the lamb would come. And it's through his finished work. And we enter into rest by believing that the work is finished in Christ. See? But the pressure was being put on them to go back under the law. To leave that, to not stay in rest, but to go back to the law and try to earn their, their righteousness again. It's still going on today. 
preachers, but well-meaning preachers doing the same thing. But verse 11 says, this is such a wording, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Go to Numbers 13. Numbers 13. Now this is the story that he's talking about where they sent in the spies into the promised land. This is, this is before the 40 years in the wilderness. He's brought them up to the promised land and he's telling them, all right, now let's go in, let's go in and I'm going to give you the land. God, has, if you read the whole thing, God has made them all kinds of promises. He has given them his word. I will send my angel before you. He shall drive his enemies out from the land. And there's two people in this story that believe God. There, there's two people that entered into rest. That's Joshua and Caleb. They believed what God said. All right? All the rest of them are a type of that unbelief that kept them from entering in. All right? And Hebrews says it so clear. The ones that couldn't enter in, God, from God's point of view, they had an evil heart of unbelief. Boy, that sounds wicked. Let's look at it. See how wicked it was. So, uh, Numbers 13, 17. Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan. Now, again, my, my grandson's over here. I want him to understand a few things. These people had been slaves for 400 years. They were not trained battle people. They grew up moving stones for to build pyramids. And, I mean, they, they were slaves. They, they, this is not a, a, a people that were skilled in war and that type of thing. They had the mentality like that. God's saying, I'm going to send you into battle here. I want you to go and conquer this land. Now he's saying, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to send my angels ahead of you. I will be with you, and you will conquer the land. You'll drive them out. So they're, they're there. And Moses says, let's go check it out. So he sends in these spies to check out the land. So Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get you up this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwells therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds. And what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not, and be you of a good courage, and bring of the fr fruit of the land. Bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. So they went up, and they searched the land. From the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob, as men came to Hamath, and they ascended by the south, and came unto Hebron, where uh, all those guys <laughs> and the children of Anak were. <laughs> now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And they came into the brook of Eshcol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bear it between two men upon a staff. I cannot imagine what that looked like to people who had been slaves for 400 years. No, no telling what they were given to eat, you know. And suddenly they're in a land where one cluster of grapes is so big. You got the sons of Anak were giants. They need big grapes. <laughs> well, there were. Sons of Anak were giants. They're huge, you know. They need grapes, man. Their grapes were so big, one cluster. They had to put it, two guys, and they put a pole, like a staff, in between on the shoulders, and it took them both to carry one cluster of grapes. I'd like to, I wonder if those grapes were as big as basketballs. I wonder, you know. I don't know. They're big grapes, anyway. What, what, boy, wouldn't that look like something to you? You've been a slave. Your people have been a slave for 400 years. Okay. <clears throat> And they returned, okay, verse 20, let's see, verse 23. And they came into the brook of Eshcol, and they cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bear it two upon a staff. And they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs, and I bet they were big too. 
The place was called the brook Eshcol because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from there, from thence. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. So they spent a while over there. Okay. A month and 10 days. And then they, <clears throat> they went and came to Moses and to Aaron. And to all the congregation of the children of Israel. Unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh. And brought back word unto them. And to all the congregation. And showed them the fruit of the land. You know what the type and shadow of that is? We've all had the privilege of watching how the Lord uses our pastor in the gifts. I never forget some of the miracles. I mean, I've seen more miracles at this church. I never forget the things that I've seen. Now, there's more that we should see, and Dave would be the first one to agree with that. But I thank God for what I have seen. And you know what that is? That's my cluster of grapes. He's gone in far enough to bring out some of that cluster of grapes for us to see. And we're going, man, this is possible. This is real. Remember that one guy that they brought that time? He'd already been through several surgeries, and he was from Oklahoma City, if I remember right. And Man, he was just all twisted up. You remember that guy? And he's, they put him in a chair right about in that area, and Dave prayed for him, and he's just all twisted up. And, and Dave, he just prayed for a little while and went off and doing whatever, something else, you know, ministering to somebody else over here, wasn't looking. But I sat close to where this guy was, and I'm watching him. And it's just like he just started kind of unfolding in that chair. Pretty soon he looks around kind of like a drunk man. He's like, where am I? You know, he's kind of looking around. Now, he couldn't walk. They had to help him in, you know. While he's in that daze, he, he's kind of looking around, sitting in that chair, looking around. And almost not realizing what he's doing, I think, he stood up. <laughs> then he began to walk. And he started walking all the way around that area over there. Come up this way, walked around again. Pretty soon he's talking. Came back a week or two later and gave his testimony that the doctors had done. All, they already told him, said, we have, we have, I think it was two surgeries, might have been three, huh, that he'd had. But they're saying, we can't do anything else for you. That's as good as you're going to get. Well, it wasn't very good. There's nothing else we can do for you. But there sure was something else God could do. See, to me, that was a cluster of grapes. I'm going, oh, my God. I watched that guy just unfold and walk around and. And he came back to two or three services, and he'd give his testimony, and he was just walking fine. See? That's our cluster of grapes when you see. That's just one of many. We could all just give testimony, and to me, that's that cluster of grapes. It's good. So they saw that uh, they showed them the fruit of the land, verse 27. And, he told, and they told him and said, We came unto the land, whither thou sent us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. This is the fruit of it. Boy, I bet they were rejoicing and happy. Glory to God. We're going to get to live there. We're going to have basketball grapes. This is great. Nevertheless. You've got to be careful of nevertheless. It's kind of like yabbit. I've been attacked by whole herds of yabbits. Have you ever? Yeah, but. You know. And nevertheless. It says, nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. Now, what you're about to, listen, what we're reading here now is what God calls an evil heart of unbelief. And what you're going to find, now pay attention, this is the soul presenting facts exactly as they truly existed. But the conclusion that they come to was strictly based on the soul computing the facts and coming to a decision opposite to what God said. That's why he called it evil. An evil heart of unbelief. When it dawned on me, evil heart of unbelief equals soul believing true facts. I said, oh my God. How many times have I said, I, I can't do that, God? I, you, you must be talking about Dave. You couldn't be asking me to do that. God, I can't even afford to do that. Have you seen my checkbook? And I always feel like he says, have you seen mine? But anyway, this is, this is an evil heart of unbelief. Watch this. 
Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. True. The cities are walled and very great. True. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. See, that doesn't mean much to us, but it meant a lot to them because the sons of Anak were giants. And the whole, I, I bet it, when they said that, I bet it all through the congregation you heard, Ooh, sons of Anak are there? The giants? What? The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south? True. The Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. True. The Canaanites dwell by the sea in the coast of Jordan. Now right about there, Caleb's already had enough. Caleb is a type of the spirit man here. He is the, he is the part of you. This is type and shadow, but your spirit has a message for your soul. Shut up. Stop it with that nonsense. What has the facts got to do with truth? Jesus said, Father, thy word is truth. And truth changes facts. But an evil heart of unbelief, which functions out of the soul, it'll analyze all the facts and come to a decision. And it doesn't care what God said. And that's the danger of functioning by the soul. And God calls it an evil heart of unbelief. How many times have I done that? I didn't leave the trucks because of that. He, he, just the simple little thing. You know, I've been, here I've been, I, I came to that Dave Roberson church and he messed me up like he messed you up. He told me if I prayed in tongues, God would come and stuff. So I started praying in tongues, you know. And of course, along with that, in English, every now and then you throw in one of these. Oh, God, use me, God. Oh, God, I want to obey you, God. And you're praying in tongues. Oh, God, I want to obey you. Talk to me, God. I want to hear you, God. Praying in tongues, praying in tongues, and then one day he answers your prayer. And I'll never forget it. Just I can, I can take you to the mile marker in Arkansas on Interstate 40, right where I was. Sound, it was so clear to me that if you'd have been in the cab of the truck, you would have heard it. But I don't know if that's true or not. Here I've been praying, oh God, use me. Use me, God. Let me hear your voice. Pray in tongues till my lips fall off on the floor, I feel like. Yeah. And then I hear him. This is your last trip as a truck driver. When you get back, give your dispatcher two weeks notice. He will not require it of you, and you will be free to serve me full time. What part of that is hard to understand? <laughs> I knew exactly what he was saying. But there was in Gary an evil heart of unbelief because my mind began calculating right away. I have a car payment, God. And I didn't ask these questions out loud, but based on my action, <laughs> I might as well have. I didn't actually say this, but my soul had all these kind of questions. God, are you aware that I have a car payment? Are you aware my wife has this eating habit? <laughs> she wants to eat every day, and most days more than once. You know, we have bills to pay, God. Is there, is there a vacation plan? Do I know, can I know what my salary will be? Uh, is there a company car? Uh, I didn't really ask those questions. But my soul, if you want to know the truth, was calculating all of those things. And boy, the silence was deafening. Because he wanted me to believe him. Trust him. Step out and obey him. But in Gary on that day, there was an evil heart of unbelief that because I had all of those questions in the natural and every one of them. See, the world would say, we're just being prudent. You're just being wise. You know? No. You're never prudent and you're never wise when you disobey God. If the world would have said, oh, you, no, you did the right thing. And God looks at that same thing and says, that's an evil heart of unbelief. See, when he's spoken, that's it. His words 
become your life. And that's, see, that's Tim's part of the equation. What's, what Tim's been bringing forward are all of these now, present day speakings and previous day that apply, you know, I mean, it really are right now. And he's going, don't forget what God has said. This is what God has said. Because the yabbits are always attacking your brain. Yeah, but nobody else is empty in hospitals. Yeah, but I, I, I lost my temper and swore yesterday. Or whatever it is, you know. I'm barely, I'm barely able to pay my light bill. And you want me to empty hospitals? What's wrong with you? You know? <laughs> it's called an evil heart of unbelief. And it's when you're functioning out of the soul. I didn't see that for so long. That is how the soul functions. It's a calculator. It's a laptop. It's not designed to follow God. It's supposed to be a tool of your spirit. To help you. See, Caleb saw the same facts. And look at, we didn't even read what he said, did we? I'm sorry. You know it anyway. You could probably preach as, as good as me. Verse 30. So they're, they're rattling off all of these facts. That's the yeah buts. Yeah but this and yeah but that. I know God gave us the land. Yeah but. Da -da 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 -da. And Caleb. Or you could say the spirit man. He stood up. <laughs> he stilled the people. How did he do that? Shut up. <laughs> or something. I don't know how he did it. But he did it. And he said. Now here's your spirit. Let us go up at once and possess it. He doesn't care about no facts. Because God spoke. We have God's word. What does the size of those people have to do when you compare them with our God? But see, your soul will always compare it with you. Your spirit. He goes, we're not alone in this. My God is with me. We are well able to take the land. Spirit man. We're well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able. There it is. That's your evil heart right there. We be not able. What did they base that statement on? Facts. True facts. What I mean is actual facts, not made up stuff. That is exactly how the soul will always function. You'll never obey God. You'll never step out and believe him. Till you get past that. That's why again and again. I, he's having Tim bring, bring forward. The blueprint. Not only for the prayer center. But he's asking you. What has God said to you? What has he said to you? That is your life. That is your life. Well, why aren't you obeying it? Well, for, I will use Gary, my car payment. You know what the most amazing, time out, the most amazing thing, I was so concerned about that stinking car payment, I don't even remember now how much it was, but at the time it was all the money in the world. That stupid car payment. Once I obeyed him, from then till now, we've never had another car payment. Never. He's always provided cars for us. And I've never sold a car except one time when the guy wouldn't let me give it to him. And I had to charge him like a nominal nothing. But he wouldn't let me give it to him. But God wanted him to have it. So I don't know way for him to have it. He had, he had to pay because he demanded it. But didn't that something? And I didn't sow him to get a car. No. I gave him because God wanted me to give him. That's the way you do it. Amen. He was so worried about this car payment. Now see, and he could have told me that. You know, God's not stupid. He could have said, Gary, calm down. Obey me, Gary. I'll provide all your cars. You'll never have another car payment. He could have told me that. He didn't. And I was praying, trust me, he had opportunity. <laughs> Why didn't he? He's not wanting me to obey him based on that kind of thing. He wants me to obey him because of who he is. Trust him. He's my father. I can trust him. He'll take care of me. I don't need any guarantees in the natural. I need a guarantee in the spiritual. If that's what he said, that's, that's good enough. Man, I'm preaching good tonight. I can tell I'm preaching good. It's good stuff. 
I never understood what an evil heart of unbelief was. And it's when the soul makes decisions based on facts that are contrary to the word of God. Now, even as I say that, our soul is a good tool. God gave it to us for the natural things in life, okay? We're talking about when it comes to hearing and obeying God. God does not expect me to fast and pray to know when to change the oil in my car. He gave me an odometer for that. I can tell when it reaches a certain number of miles, it is time to change the oil. I remember that time that this quote, 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 prophet was going to stay at Dave and Rosalie's for a while. And, uh, they, you know, they had an extra bedroom. And he says, I so, I'm so, I only move by God. I don't even wash my clothes unless a Holy Ghost tells me to. And Rosalie says, if you're going to be sleeping in one of our beds, you're going to wash your clothes when I tell you to. <laughs> he did. Though it's a wonderful, my laptop is a wonderful tool. It does all kinds of things for me, and I'm so glad that I have it. But it is not supposed to hear God for me. It's not supposed to be ordering me around. I'm supposed to be getting my directions from God and using my laptop as a tool. That's exactly the way the soul, the mind, is supposed to, to function. Also, Caleb had a mind. Caleb's a type of the spirit man, though, see? And he's going, well, yeah, well, there's facts. What's that got to do with what God said? What's that got to do with it? This is what God said. Let's trust him, step out in faith, and he'll do what he said. Man, I'm liking this myself. I'm going too slow, though. So Caleb stilled the people, verse 30, Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Glory to God, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, <laughs> No, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Boy, right there you can see the problem. They are stronger than we. If you write in your Bible, write, truth. That was a fact too. But it was an evil heart of unbelief because they were comparing the facts with their own strength instead of comparing the facts with God's strength. They sure were not stronger than their God. Hmm. And they brought up an evil report of the land. If you, if you write in the margin, evil equal factual. Evil. Well, didn't they not bring a factual report? The only evil thing was the conclusion that they came to. See, that's what made it evil. God knew all those facts. Did those facts move God? Do you think God knew those facts before they knew those facts? And he says, I'll be with you. I'll drive the enemy out. Just believe me. Go in. I've, given, I've already given you the land. What's the problem here? Didn't say it quite like that. <laughs> hmm. So they, they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched under the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people the, that we saw in it are men of great stature. That's true. And there we saw the giants, see, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Hmm. None of that is true. Well, all of that is factual, but their conclusions are all wrong. So all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried and the people wept that night and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron and the whole congregation said unto them oh would God that we had died in the land of Egypt oh would God we had died in this wilderness wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey were it not better for us to return unto Egypt? What did that sound like to God? 
These people have no faith at all. They don't. No wonder he said over here, they don't know my ways. They don't know me. They don't know my ways. They can't enter into my rest like that. So they said one to another, well, let's make a captain. Let us return to Egypt. So then Moses and Aaron, they fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. They're going to, they're going to worship God no matter what. Amen. So Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, okay, <laughs> which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes, and they spake. And here comes, this is a type of your spirit. They spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it, is it a good land? If the Lord delight in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us. A land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord. Neither fear ye the people of the land. For they are bread for us. In other words, we'll eat them up. Their defense is departed from them. And the Lord is with us. Fear them not. That's your spirit. You want to discern a soul from spirit? Oh, that's the bad day I ever came to that prayer center. I've been praying and I've been a fasting. And oh, God... My car's broke down. I lost my job. Nobody likes me anymore. And all my relatives think I've gone crazy. And I'm kind of wondering myself. Stop it. What's wrong with you? You're operating out of your soul. Stop it. If God be for us, that devil's defense has departed from him. God's with us and we shall possess the land. Amen. We shall have revival. We will walk in victory. Hallelujah. That's the truth. That's the truth. Now you're operating out of your spirit. Now you're talking in agreement with God. Glory to God. Mm. I am preaching it, Gary. <laughs> it's a good sign when Daisy says, preach it, Gary. I like that. Hallelujah. <laughs> but all the congregation... They wanted to stone them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses. Now you remember over there when it says the provocation. Remember over there where he says those don't be like those in the provocation. Notice. And the Lord said unto Moses, how long will this people provoke me? Whew. Well, I got a question. I'm going to ask me and not you. Gary, how long are you going to provoke God? Gary, how, how long are you going to keep looking at the circumstances and saying it's not possible? He must be talking to Dave and not you. How long, Gary? Are you ever going to enter into this rest? How long are you going to keep walking by the soul? Instead of walking by the Spirit. Go back to Hebrews for a moment. We're about done. Y'all liking this? Boy, what a year. I'm so glad I go to this church. I really am. Mm. Now, this time we read right up until verse 12. Let's go on past a little ways this time. We'll start with verse 12 again. Hebrews 4.12. For the Word of God is alive. But boy, does that mean it's powerful? It's sharper. You know, later on, do you know they still, that next generation, boy, if that's not a type of the prayer center, now for 40 years, that's a generation in biblical terms. The old man is dying off. The new man is coming to maturity. Is that not a type of pray and mortify? Pray, building yourself up and mortify. The old man being mortified and the new man being built up on his most holy faith. For we've got to have a whole generation here putting away the old man and the new man rising up. And when it came right down to it, the new generation had to believe God just like the first generation should have. Because God didn't change his word. They operated on the same word he gave the, same, the first bunch. And they just believed. The difference was they believed it. And they acted on it. And Joshua, the spirit, the type of the spirit, 
Joshua and Caleb led the way. You know what Caleb said? I believe it was his birthday because he said this day. I think it was 85 years ago. This, no, 45 years, thank you. 45 years ago, I stood on this mountain. Moses said I could have it. He said, my eyesight is not dimmed. My strength today is as it was then. And this was the giant where the sons of Anak lived. I and mean, this was the mountain where the sons of Anak lived. He says, give me this mountain. Your spirit man, he ain't afraid of no giant. He ain't afraid of no facts. He's not afraid of no x-rays. He's not afraid of no doctor's report. He's not afraid of anything. He says, God is with me. These facts are bread for me. Let's eat them up. Give me this mountain. I'll have exactly what God said I'd have. Whew. Glory to God. That's walking by the Spirit. Your spirit believes God. And that's you. That's the real you, you courageous overcomer. Mm. Glory to God. Mm. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, the joints and marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Boy, it sure did it with that bunch, didn't it? And he's sure doing it with us now. Amen. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and opened under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. He already knows every fault. There's no point trying to hide. Get on in there, pray in tongues. Let every stronghold come to light. And let that light put it to death. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. You could put right there, like Joshua and Caleb did. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us, therefore, come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. I don't care what the need is. I don't care what the facts are. I don't care how many others have fell at the feet of the sons of Anak. They are bread for you. You will have what God said you'd have. You can trust him when he tells you to do something. Where he leads, he provides. He will anoint you. He will deliver you. And you will have, you will accomplish everything that he said. Let us have that same spirit of Joshua and Caleb. Let us go up at once and possess it. For God has given it to us. Did you get anything out of that? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The walk of the Spirit, the walk of power. That's who we are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 